Good morning. We apologize for the delay, but we've been having a bit of a sound issue. So I shall just hand over to Mark Shuttleworth for his Ubuntu Q&A buff. Um, okay, so this buff really exists because there wasn't enough time for all the questions people wanted to ask after the uh, sort of Ubuntu annual report back. So uh, do you, if, if anyone has questions, then we should uh, climb straight into it. We had a nice uh, like over dinner discussion last night and uh, there were quite a few people there. So that we had some good brainstorming on things that we can do and we can touch on that if, uh, if people ask questions related to that. But maybe we should just climb straight in with, uh, with questions. Okay, so who's got the first question? <laughs> well, that was an easy buff. Thank you very much. We'll be back to the more readers. Um, Don Armstrong is not here, but he wanted to ask a question. At the end, he had, his, uh, uh, he had his hands up and he came up afterwards and he asked about the governance of Ubuntu and the separation between Ubuntu and Canonical. And uh, so the governance structure is that the, the, the group which is really responsible for Ubuntu is called the Community Council. At the moment, there's one non-canonical person on there. That's Benjamin Mako Hill, um, who many of you will know. Um, he used to work for Canonical. Then he went back to study at uh, MIT, but he remains on the community. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Where did you find it? Where did you find it? All oh, right. Success. Ooh. Turn it down a little bit. Okay, so the, uh, the community council is um, the, the kind of overall body, and then there's a technical board, which also has a non-canonical person, Matthew Garrett, on it. I'm perfectly happy with both of those groups ultimately ending up with a, with a minority of canonical employed people. Um, obviously, that's going to take time because it's, it, you know, people, to get onto that, we're not just going to put anybody onto those groups, right? Those are very, very serious groups. They, they, they make a lot of decisions around Ubuntu. So to be on the technical board, they'd have to be you know, super good, really, uh, really demonstrated an exceptional knowledge of the whole distro, how it all works together, and so on, be very committed to the project. And if they weren't going to be in a Canonical employee, they would, they would then have to not want to work for Canonical, because if anyone was that good and that committed, we would want them to work for us. Um, um, but it may be, I expect that in time, what will happen is that other companies that are building stuff around Ubuntu will be happy to, to fund people to work on Ubuntu. And, uh, and in that case, we may well have you know, people who, or students, or people who, you know, just don't want to be employed, um, uh, could easily be on the technical board or the community council. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, just a minor one. Uh, Ubuntu is uh, developing an additional graphic and installer. Will it be uh, will it be merged with DI? No. So this um, DI has a graphical mode now, a GTK. I think it's GTK based mode, which Colin Watson did a fair amount of work on. Joey will probably confirm that. And um, then there's a new installer, which is which is totally different. It doesn't share any code whatsoever. It's written in Python. It has a different sort of style and approach. It's much more limited, effectively. DI is very flexible, malleable. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. I saw Full Hands was doing stuff with Zen and DI. So DI is a much more flexible kind of installer. The, 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 the graphical installer in Dapper is much more limited. It's basically just do a desktop. And so it's optimized just for that simple sort of use case. So it's much more restricted, effectively, in that way. It's free software. I think it's uploaded in Debian as well. Any other questions? Oh, I feel like I'm let off the hook very easily. Uh, again, I want the installer for Ubuntu, Kubuntu. Um, when will it be ready for uh, complex text layout languages for us? India, Cambodia? OK, I didn't know that it wasn't. Um, it should be. Yeah, I think it's just, it's just using GTK and Pango. So, so as long as you've got all the right font support, you should be, you should be OK. It shouldn't be a problem. Anybody else? Oh, that's totally easy. Biola, do you want to start early? Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, you talked about uh, Ubuntu looking at different 
uh, package uh, dependency resolution, aside from apt, I don't remember the name. Smart, Smart. how does that affect uh, the kind of the collaboration between Ubuntu and Debian? Shouldn't affect it at all because Smart doesn't, doesn't require any changes in the package formats. And there are already people using Smart with, with Debian. So I think Smart is uploaded to Debian and there are already people using it with, with Debian. It's just like that middle layer of trying to figure out when you've got this whole set of packages installed and this whole set of packages in the, in the archives with new versions and so on, figuring out what the, what the best way to sort of, the optimal way to get from here to there is. And uh, so one of the things that we like about Smart is that it will do things like consider potentially every possible path of installs and removes and then installs again. So it can say, okay, to get from here to there, first I'm gonna install this other thing. That allows me to remove this thing. Then I'm gonna install that over there. So it just has um, smarter algorithms to do that. It's not perfect. I've seen it blow up doing, doing transitions. We've tried it from like Hori to Breezy and stuff like that and it wasn't able to handle some of the transitions. So that's what we would consider edgy type technology, right? It's something that we can do. And if it works really well and so on, then we can help build the case for that to be part of the next Debian stable release. That's kind of some, the sort of thing that I think Ubuntu does very well, is find, find something new and interesting, bring it in, show that it works, and then it's very easy to, to get approval for adoption in, in Debian of new technology. And I think we've already proven that that, that process has worked quite well. Christian. Yeah, uh, I'm Christian Perrier. <clears throat> you know probably what I will be talking about. Uh, mostly Q&A processes about localization stuff. Uh, how do you think we can handle this in the future between Ubuntu and Debian mostly? And uh, how do you currently handle Q&A stuff in Rosetta? Okay, so Rosetta is this web-based translation infrastructure that we use in Ubuntu, and it's really designed to optimize the process of translating and passing translations upstream. So we've really optimized to get the translations ultimately to upstream, because for 99% of things, I believe upstream is the right place for translations to land. If a translation lands upstream, Javier will have an opinion about this. If it lands upstream, it goes to Red Hat, it goes to Debian, there's no questions about which distros it ends up in and so on. There are some things, of course, where upstream is Debian, like DI, right? And there, that depends on personal relationships, really, to, to make sure that that, that that flow happens. In terms of quality assurance, um, Rosetta basically allows you to set up a team of people who can edit a particular profile through the web. And um, uh, when we set that up, the intent was, obviously, that they would keep tight control over who was in those teams. And uh, I noticed the other day that one or two of the languages have more than 100 people in the teams, which means that they've had fantastic results if you look at how the bar chart is moving, but not so fantastic results in terms of the consistency and, and quality of those translations. So this Geordie is working with those translation teams to say, hold, you should have a process where people first, you know, first they, they demonstrate their ability to actually to do this well, and then they become part of the team. So we don't have a very, Rosetta doesn't have a very efficient review and, and approval kind of workflow process. It's either you can edit it or you can sort of make suggestions but they don't become official until, until someone who's in the team edits it. And so it depends, the quality depends a lot on how well controlled that group has been basically. Yeah, I, I had another question. Um, how do you intend in the future to interface with what we will probably soon develop in Debian for infrastructure for internationalization, which will probably not be based on Rosetta for very well-known reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you plan to integrate with stuff like WorldForge stuff, just like Javier Sola over there talked about? So there are already, there are already specs which we, we plan all of our development using specs and, and there are already specs for in the Rosetta roadmap for integration with WordForge, which is like a free software glossary management system. So the idea is that Javier's team, as Word, WordForge develops, they will set up a glossary for different languages and then we can link from Rosetta straight into that glossary. If WordForge develops like an XML RPC API, then we can start to sort of say, okay, Looking at this translation over here, we've noticed that in this language, words 
in this translation appear in the glossary, which means they have some sort of special interpretation or you should be aware of certain additional information. We can then display that directly in, in Rosetta. Rosetta itself currently has, an, has a web-based interface for uploading profiles and retrieving profiles. So there's nothing locked into Rosetta. And we can also do an XML RPC interface to allow people programmatically to say, are there any new translations? And if so, send me the profile kind of thing. Um, Ubuntu uh, does separate between here. Does separate between main universe and multiverse. Um, can you uh, elaborate who can upload to multiverse? Who does the new processing there, and why do you distribute red un uh, distributable packages? For example, for example, Adobe Reader. For example, Adobe Reader, Acrobat Reader. Acrobat Reader. Hmm? No, it's not in Debian. Okay, I'm not sure the specific licensing issues there. But so the difference between main and universe multiverse is whether or not we will do, we will guarantee that we provide security updates. The difference between universe and multiverse is basically um, free and non-free. Um, and there is an additional, there is an additional repository in Dapper, which is non-free non stuff, which has actually been certified. So stuff like IBM DB2 and things like that, VMware and so on, which are, which are sort of certified, where the companies actually provide support for it, so that you get, you get this, the assurance of sort of security updates and so on. But by default, it's not visible after an Ubuntu install. You have to go in and say, okay, I want to see this stuff. Uh, it's like adding an extra app sources line. Um, sorry, you didn't answer my question. Can you um, say I, who can upload there, which okay. people, and yes. who does the new processing there? Yes. So if you look, if you look in launchpad.net slash distro slash Ubuntu, you will see a list of those components on the left-hand side of the page. And so for main, you'll see a team Ubuntu core dev. For universe, you'll see Ubuntu dev. And then if you click on those, you'll see a list of all the people who, who have those upload privileges, basically. So um, universe and multiverse, I think, is the same group, which is, which is every, all the developers in Ubuntu. And then main and restricted would be, would be only the core developers. And uh, all core developers are also part of the MOTU because of the way Launchpad handles cascading teams. So you can easily get a full list of all the people who have upload there. Um, new processing is currently... Okay, so there's no special difference between new processing for that one. It's not exposed at the moment. It's a bit of a hack behind the scenes, like a command line tool as to, to, to the new processing. But I think that that's moving to a web-based interface. And there'll be, a, there'll be a, a, again, in that same page which describes Ubuntu in Launchpad, there'll be like an um, archive administrator's person. And you'll be able to see, which will be a team, and you'll be able to see exactly who that is. So you can figure out, you know, always who to talk to. And Ubuntu is pretty good about exposing the queue, so you can see everything that's been uploaded and where it is in the queue processing and so on. And, uh, and, and are there efforts to uh, remove the stuff which is not uh, legal to distribute at the moment? This, so we have no intent to distribute anything which is illegal to distribute. We may have, we have redistribution agreements for a variety of things, right? So we don't put them in the distro per se. We don't stick them on the CD. It's not part of the default install. There's no non-free application which is part of the default install. But there can be stuff in, in commercial or multiverse or so on where we, where we have redistribution agreements and things like that. So you could take that up. James Troop is, by and large, our most persistent license expert. But you can take that up with me or with the community council. If there's a specific example. Uh, I hardly, no, I, I doubt hardly that hard that uh, you have one for Adobe Reader because I'm bugging Adobe since nearly a year to get such a redistribution license and they only allow it to distribute on CDs but not uh, through any kind of network and uh, it's fact that you have it on your multiverse servers repository. Okay, thanks for raising it. Go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, in the world there are various uh, projects from government or from private industry to put uh, Linux in the desktop or for the government. Are, do you know in which countries they are or, uh, choosing Ubuntu? And if you know why they chose? Um, I think Ubuntu is quite popular in the countries that, that are familiar with the Debian space and that are more, that are more advanced effectively in terms of, uh, of their, their understanding and, and, and 
policies around open source and free software. So I know in China, for example, that Ubuntu has been distributed in a bunch of universities officially by the government. I know that in um, Indonesia there's some consideration of, of, of building a derivative based on Ubuntu. In most of these cases, they're not actually going to ship Ubuntu as it is. It's just that Ubuntu is a convenient starting point for a local derivative of one, of one form or another, which I'm perfectly happy with, right? I don't mind if they call it something completely different, change the brand, change the name. I see that as being part of what Ubuntu is there to, to be for. Spain, there are a couple of the provinces and regions, regions in Spain that have used Ubuntu as the, as the template for, for their own um, uh, official derivatives. In Brazil, there's work on a multimedia version of Ubuntu for use in um, telecenters for music and, and, and sound and art and stuff like that. Um, so those are all projects in various stages of production. So I just quickly want to say the reason Acrobat isn't currently non-free is because Adobe took so endlessly long to release a new reason, a uh, new release that there were so many security bugs piling up that we removed it. But um, now nobody really gives a shit. So it just hasn't been uploaded to non-free again. If you want to take it over, upload it to non-free. I think it can be uploaded. Okay, but still, if there is a potential issue there that's been raised, we'll look into it, right? right. I did have another question. Um, I've heard that there are some plans, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that, on extending Launchpad to have an email interface. It does already have an email interface for, for example, the bug tracker. So you can, you can create a bug by filing an email, by, by sending an email. You can close bugs. You can reassign bugs, do all of that sort of stuff. Um, we also have email interfaces for things like our spec tracker. So if you subscribe to a spec, then you can get notices of changes in its status. And you can even subscribe Launchpad to the wiki where the spec is, and then it'll bounce wiki change notifications out to all the subscribers of the spec. So that's kind of primitive. It's not, it's not comprehensive. But over time, it'll, it'll improve. And if you have suggestions and, uh, and ideas, then we would definitely uh, want to integrate those. Oh. So were you, were you asking about the unauthenticated email, what we, what we sort of discussed last night? Oh, okay. But there was, an interesting, there was an interesting comment in our discussion last night where say you, want to, say, say you want to subscribe to changes to a particular package or bugs from a particular package in Ubuntu. That does mean that you need to go and register at Launchpad. And so for some people that's going to be an issue because Launchpad is proprietary. That's like not using Google or not using Amazon or something like that, right? But fair enough. So we can look and see if there isn't a way, a special way for DDs to be able to say, okay, I'm not, I don't have a Launchpad account. In other words, I, I don't have a password. I can't log in and update my details and so on. But you can use my email address in this way, right? And so you can, you can if you would send me something, you can send it to me, but I don't want to have an account, which is, you know, a fairly, what the French would call a nuanced position. But um, I think we could quite happily figure something out like that if that would help people. The other thing that we sort of figure we can do now is we can probably automatically send Ubuntu change notifications to the Debian package tracking system. And if you subscribe to your Debian package with the derivatives tag, then you should be able to get that stuff automatically without um, subscribing to Launchpad. Could you please share some stuff on ship it program? Sure. Um, I think the final tally was about. Okay, the question was for statistics on the ship it program, which is where we make CDs available around the world. Some some really interesting statistics. We ship more CDs to Iceland than to Japan. Uh, we ship more CDs to Kenya than to Japan, as far as as far as I recall. So some very interesting country, country um, derivatives uh, or, or, or variations. Um, about 15% of those CDs went to the states. And so the states is actually relatively low in terms of, if you think of normal technology adoption, right? So it's a very, it's a very broad based kind of program. Um, I think about 200 countries ship CDs to about 200 countries, including more CDs to Pitcairn Island than there are supposedly people on Pitcairn Island. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, in total, I think about six million breezy CDs in total, which is a lot. Um, um, obviously, there's a big win for us in DAPA because we cut the whole thing down to one CD. That was a big part of the drive to not have two 
CDs and install and a live CD. So that's why we have to do this kind of simplified installer. Um, we still have the DI-based installer for server editions, but I don't think we will ship server edition CDs. Okay. Uh, yet another question about localization, of course. Uh, do you have currently contacts or plans for localization, especially in the, of the installer, because this is the beginning of the, for how you install Ubuntu or Debian, actually, for African languages and also for Afrikaans? For Afrikaans. Um, at the moment, it's all kind of community-driven. We've done one, one language, one African language, where, we, where I funded it personally, basically, because we wanted to figure out from scratch what does it cost to do a desktop pretty well. It turns out to be about two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars from scratch to hire professional translators to do the whole thing. So at least we have a number now. There are five hundred um, African languages, so I'm not going to fund many more on that basis. Where Rosetta is weak is because it's web based and because the pages are quite heavy effectively, you've got a lot of information coming and going. Um, it's not good for languages in countries where bandwidth is poor, which is true across most of Africa. So in Africa, we have to figure up a different strategy where what we will probably do is get people to work locally, right, using either something like Poodle or, or just using Kbabel or um, G Translator or one of the local desktop editing translation files and then upload just in one shot to Rosetta. So Rosetta there just becomes a convenient way of keeping track of all of the different things. So if you have 10 different sprints happening covering different files, then they can still pull up one page that says how they're doing overall. Yeah, I think that in the case, especially for Africa, you may have a, a different case than we have for other communities and uh, the concept of community-driven translation may not work very well because we all know that in these places, most of the people interested in technology are actually not interested in translation in their own language. They are perfectly comfortable with English, with French and most of the time. Uh, so I think it has to be a different way, mostly probably in involving more institutional organizations. Right. More, more top-down, more driven on the basis of this being the state saying this is a good thing. So that's one of the things that we do with Canonical is we lobby very hard. Whenever I meet a government official, it's one of the things that I say they absolutely must do, right? Because first, it's a unique thing that they can get from free software that they can't get from proprietary software. Second, it completely changes their ability to get technology into communities. And third, if they, if they precede it effectively, if they, if they underwrite a lot of the translation, then in theory, they, are, they, are, they are then have an incentive to distribute that work, get lots of users, and then something like Rosetta is very good for keeping translations up to date. Because once you've got 95%, people like to sort of go, it's like a wiki, right? Go and fix that last 5%. But getting from zero to 95% doesn't happen magically on its own. And you know how much translation work there is to do, right? You can go to a single page on which will bring up all the translations in DAPA. And we've got maybe 12 languages that are very well translated, um, and maybe another 20 languages that are, you know, there's good translations for the important stuff. And then after that, nothing. And there are 350 languages with more than a million speakers. So if we want free software widely used in the native language, then there's just a huge amount of work to be done. So. Yeah, you just mentioned that you only use DI for the server install anymore, but as far as I know, you use DI for the live CD on Breezy. Does that mean there's a new technology um, for Dapper to boot, or you're do you still you're, use you're absolutely right, basically. Yeah, that the, that the, the core underlying live CD technology is still DI. Ah, okay. But the, but the, it's not. Okay, so apparently there isn't. And Matt Zimmerman would be the right guy to talk to. Do you want to answer? Just interested what it would be, but if it's... Do you have a specific question about uh, how the new live CD works, or...? Yeah. Yeah. What, what is I don't the know. I'll, I'll look up the documentation. Of what the, I just wanted to know what's in it like. Did, were you familiar with the Breezy live CD setup? Yeah, no, it was DI-based, and then... Right, uh, and it was based on the Casper package, yeah. and it still is now, it's just the Casper package has changed, so if you look in the same place, you can see how the works is based on init ramfs tools and UnionFS and SquashFS. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I didn't understand this very well. For the live CD uh, installation, um, 
Do you have to translate the Debian installer? No. For example, for Kubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of a separate issue. Um, in addition to the live CD technology itself, which used to use DI modules for bootstrapping itself and no longer does, uh, the actual installer called Ubiquity, which is uh -huh. used on the live CD, uses Debian, it uses DI modules for certain parts of the installation, the partitioner and so forth, so it's reusing those strings. So if you translate DI, then we use those translations in Ubiquity as well. But on top of that, you still have to translate uh, specific parts of the Ubuntu or Kubuntu installer. Correct. There are a few strings which are unique to the yeah. graphical interface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But they're actually merged into one set of templates. So if you translate, you know, the installer stuff and Ubuntu, it's all together. Good. Yeah. I learn something new every day. Yes. Um, regarding the, the, the companies that have signed up or are in the website for providing support for Ubuntu. The marketplace, yeah. Uh -huh. Have you gotten any feedback or comments or any cases that they have implemented or you know, any, anything no. that you could share? Not, not that I'm aware of. That, that, the number of companies there is growing astronomically. That I, we don't have a very cohesive program effectively for working, um, for, 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 for building a stronger interaction. We have, a, we have a slightly different partnership and alliance program where we have more formal relationships with people. But that marketplace program is really almost like a wiki. People just come in and say, please, would you put our company over there? This is our uh, contact details, and this is a short description of, of what we do. Yeah. Do you plan, or do you have ever considered to So do you plan <laughs> do you plan to add something in the code of conduct about uh, giving back um, stuff to Debian in terms of patches or in terms of uh, BTS or everything else? So we, that's a that's a really good point. I think we do have stuff there which says, you know, w play nice with the rest of the free software community. And if we don't, I'd be absolutely happy to put that in. We do modify the code of conduct every now and then when we do it. And then sub second to the code of conduct, we also have a bunch of kind of guides which say, what does the code of conduct mean in IRC, for example? What does it mean on mailing lists? What does it mean in the wiki and in forums? And we could definitely have an, ex you know, a what does the code of conduct mean for developers, which would certainly include notifying people when you're doing work, making sure that you publish the work in the right sort of, you know, release early and often, uh, make sure that you, you work well with other people's bug tracking systems, whether that's Debian, whether that's, that's, that's upstream, whether it's other distros. And I, I think we could certainly draft stuff like that up. That's, again, stuff to raise with the community council. Mark? Um, I read about the D-Package version 2 uh, uh, paper. Um, can you say something about the time frame when it will be seen or something? Between, because it's mostly uh, Ubuntu developed as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of folks who work at Canonical who are interested and involved in that stack. Um, there's no particular drive from Canonical's perspective to do D-Package version 2. There is some interesting big challenges that are out there that we'd like to see done, but and, and we obviously we have the resources to do them, um, but they're not necessarily strategic priorities for us. For example, multi-arch. And there are a couple of proposals floating around in Debian for multi-arch. If you're familiar with Toliff and Scott's proposal, that's, that's the thing that we're most kind of comfortable with. So obviously we hope that if work starts on dpackage version 2, it follows that line. Um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are other areas where I, where I think we could all benefit from good work, right? There are a whole bunch of different source package formats out there and the, the existence of those varieties partly is a good thing because they each exist to serve a particular sort of model or need or, or set of requirements or way of doing things. Sometimes that's actually been a source of conflict between Ubuntu and Debian and other distros or, dist or derivatives. For example, I've often seen a case where uh, uh, either an Ubuntu guy has repackaged something that's already in Debian because he wanted to use a different packaging system or vice versa. We've had packages that existed in Ubuntu and a Debian guy said, I'm going to create a from scratch package because I don't like that packaging system. Um, we have a guideline for developers not to change the packaging format. Um, unless there's an absolutely compelling reason, like for example, the XFCE guys want to build a lot of the, a lot of the um, 
GNOME applications without GNOME support. So they use GTK, but they leave out the GNOME interaction stuff. And in, in many cases, they just can't do it using the existing packaging formats. That hasn't happened for Dapper because we were in sort of quite tight release process when we got there. They will try and consult with the Debian guys, but if they absolutely can't get any traction there, then they will go to a different packaging format where they can build from a single source package the GNOME versions and the XFCE versions. So what would I like to see? One of the things I'd like to see is a lot of thinking and work done on the source packaging side of things so that we can bring in the best of CDBS and Dpatch and all of the different proposals and systems, Wig and Pen and so on, that have, that have been put in place. Um, and and, and, and kind of get people using a common set of free software tools to manage those, where one of the fee key features we get is, is better interaction between distros, right? So for example, there have been some complaints about that when we automatically publish our changes versus Debian, that you get a monolithic diff. Well, you only get a monolithic diff if the Debian package, am I right here? <laughs> As I understand it, you only get a monolithic diff if the Debian package itself uses the old monolithic diff format, right? So in other words, if we can't easily pull our changes automatically, then what you get back is our changes not pulled out automatically. That's not to be mean, it's just because automatically we can't easily do anything. Whereas if the, the Debian package is using split out diffs, then it's easy for us to say, oh, here are our extra changes, and it's diff one, diff two, diff three, diff four. And so of course then that's much easier for the Debian maintainer to take. So in the past that wasn't so important, but I think in future if we look towards a world where there's lots of derivatives and we want to share, Right, then having source package formats which make that easy and having general sort of agreed practices that make that easy is going to help all of us. So that's, that's where I'll have an interest because I want to reduce the cost of shifting, shifting stuff around right, from Debian into Ubuntu and from Ubuntu into Debian equally. So there is no real time frame because you know, it, unless, unless we decide to invest in it, which we haven't yet decided to do, then it's a scratch your own itch kind of thing for Toliff and Scott and other people who want to collaborate with them on Dpackage too. Bdel. I think this will work. So you were just mentioning, you know, if we end up in a world where there are lots and lots of derivatives that, and it's kind of interesting because one of the things that for a long time seemed to be really interesting to me about Debian space is that people figured out how to do lots of flavors, as I like to call them, and other people have other names for them, where one of the defining characteristics is all of that work did one way or another end up within sort of the defining boundaries of what we call Debian. And one of the defining characteristics of what I called a flavor was that it was sort of a proper subset of the whole in some sense. It seems to me that things really are a little different when we start talking about um, a world in which a lot of stuff is happening beyond that boundary and we have, you know, layers of derivatives. And it seems to me that some things do get more challenging and it almost it almost seems to me to put more pressure on us to figure out how to be successful about you know, making sure that we don't end up with too many different places where little bits of goodness in the form of patches for this and that end up um, sort of stashed away. I wonder if you have any thoughts, uh, since I know you have very strong feelings and have talked in keynotes and other things before about technologies like distributed rever revision control and so forth, if you have any thoughts about sort of where we are, where some of those things ought to be directed so that we don't end up in sort of, you know, the, the, the chaos and pathos of way too many little derivatives that are each caching too much goodness. And, and lost work effectively. It's, yeah, it's exactly. enormously frustrating to me when I see how, how, because it's hard to move work upstream or because it's hard to move work to Debian or to Ubuntu or to, you know, to Red Hat or wherever, that a lot of work gets either duplicated or just falls on the ground, right? These guys go charging ahead, they do a little derivative that's optimized for a particular thing, they do interesting stuff, and then they get bored and they move on and that work rots, bit rots. And that's a loss to all of us, right? Um, so I do think tools and formats and protocols and best practices are, are the answer. Now the example I would give is the Linux kernel, right? The Linux kernel has the Linux's tree where he takes care of, and they agree to take care of, a certain set of use cases. So a certain set of architectures are in tree, like Zen one day will be in tree. But then there's a ton of other places where Linux work happens. And so people maintain their own trees. 
This used to be an absolute nightmare because there, there was no infrastructure to, to move stuff around. And Git, whatever its other flaws may be, Git has actually made that process a whole lot more cohesive because you can now, at least cohesively through a single interface, if you know where work is being done, you can go and say, all right, how are they different? So it allows people to pursue their specialist interests, um, but at the same time allows other people to go in and, and do an audit and say, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's inter interesting pull it in. Lead out. So you're absolutely right. On the other hand, um, I may actually have found the patch, and it looks like it might be something from like last year that hasn't been pushed upstream yet. So this is one of those places where good tools aren't sufficient, and it comes back to this conversation I commented on at the start of my you know governance thing the other day that I had with, with Cliff from uh, the Linspire crowd about the fact that if we want to make things work, in this kind of a context, we have to figure out how to be more active, active about it. You know, both people who've done interesting stuff pushing it and the other side also. Right, so but basically both sides need to agree to be willing to do a certain amount of work. And then what needs to happen is agreements on how we make that work as easy as lightweight as possible. So first everyone needs to agree that this is actually a good thing. And second then, what, what, what the responsibilities are on, on each side. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not just tools. It's also social contracts and protocols and agreements and covenants. Yeah. Uh, I've just found uh, you at Ubuntu have a marketing team in Launchpad. So what do you think will be the role of marketing teams and distributions? So th that, that team is self-forming, right? That, that team popped up on its own and they, they do their own thing. They do stuff like um, uh, announce in different countries if there's a new team that's getting together and doing work there or either on translation or on uh, a, a derivative, um, so loco teams, things like that. They, they write up guides to you know, what's new in the distro when we do a new release. Um, it's not hugely active at this stage, but I'm very, I'm very supportive of it, right? I think it's a, very, it's a very healthy part of the whole ecosystem, and if guys want to do that, then I, I think that's awesome. They should have the space to go run and do that. Um, recently, well, fairly recently, we uh, voted to um, take certain GFDL documents out of Maine. Uh, I'm just curious if Ubuntu was going to follow with that decision. If I'm not sure exactly how your your freeness rules relate. I know they're based on Debian's free yeah. software guidelines, but I don't know if it's as so strict or. Our, our view on the GFDL is we consider it free, um, but we would look on a case by case basis at the use of at the use of um, what are they called invariants, right? And we've just not come across a, a, a case where we weren't comfortable with the way that was being used, so. So that's been, that's been our approach. We're comfortable with the GFDL. We don't have a major problem with it. So the Debian's decision is a in, very interesting example of how I think Debian can, it, it potentially marginalizes itself, right? I would like to say, you know, upstream is king. If upstream ships a tarball, we should express what we do as changes against that tarball, changes which other people can take or not take. And I really do think that if Debian wants to be successful, it, it, it should be very careful always to preserve the ability for other people to still work with Debian, but be somewhat selective in, what, in, 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 in how they choose to do that. In the same way that a de Debian derivative can create its own main, which includes whatever crack it wants, right? And people do, right? Scola and others include you know, Java or whatever it is in pre-license change days, because that's what they feel they need to do for their set of users. Now, in terms of the collaboration side of things, right, if Debian has changed the original Tata GZs and they're different to upstream tarballs, then that becomes extremely different for, difficult for other distros to work with effectively. So we haven't really bothered to put back um, stuff that Debian has taken out in DFG, DFSG free cases, except in cases where we thought it was pretty essential. I think there, are, there might be some cases where we've added it back as a separate package or we've done something different. So again, I would just say, without passing judgment on what's happened in the past, that one, of the, one thing that it would be good for Debian to bear in mind as it goes forward is that, is that if Debian wants to be this universal environment, which is what I love about Debian, right? Lots of architectures, you know, lots of packages, harnessing 
parallelism, harnessing all of those things, together with Debian Legal's very clear-cut analysis of you know, what's in, what's out, and so on, but still leaving space for non-free, right? I mean, Debian voted to keep non-free, right? So if you're willing to do that, then perhaps it would be possible also to express some of these other policy ideas in ways which don't exclude or make life excessively difficult for other derivatives of Debian which take a different policy view. So it's asking quite a difficult thing. It's asking you to say, here's our set of policies, right? Here's how we implement them, but we respect when other people want to build off our work with a different set of policies. The reason I would say that that's useful for Debian to think about is because people are going to do it anyway, right? And more importantly, if you, if you want to be a good partner for collaboration, understand that difference, that, that, that importance of saying, here's work, I make it available under a free software license, here's what I express about my policies, but I respect your right and willingness to do things slightly differently. I want to just close with, with, with an observation. I've been really thinking hard about this social process and coming up with good examples and bad examples up in the free software community. And I think the guy who, in my mind, has been, had the most success in terms of getting his ideas and his thoughts widely used has been Linus Torvalds, right? If you look at back to 1991 or 1992, there were a number of free software kernels out there. And we should ask, why did Linux become so enormously popular and successful? And I think it's because Linux considers it a success when somebody takes the Linux kernel and does something different with it. Even if he wouldn't merge it into his main line, even if he thinks it's total utter crack, it has been shown in days gone by that sometimes things that Linus said were total utter crack, two years later got merged into the main line by Linus, right? That technical ideas, philosophical ideas, and, and so on, should be allowed to flourish, and that, you know, ultimately it boils down to this. I think Linus counts it a win when someone does something out there with Linux, when they put it on a watch or a PDA or a mainframe or something like that. And I think, ultimately, we all, when we do free software, people are going to take it and use it in other ways. And we each have a personal decision to make as to whether that's a win or a loss. With Debian, there's no institutional view, right? It's a personal decision that every developer takes. And I would say it's actually, we all end up a lot happier if your general view is, when somebody takes my stuff and does interesting things with it, does different things with it, it's not a loss to me. It's part of what free software is all about. And in fact, if we, if we all take that view, then Debian is going to be successful in the same way that Linux has been successful. So thanks very much for the Q's and A's, and I'm still available. Oh, and the other one thing that came out last night is that you guys should absolutely know that you can raise stuff about Ubuntu either formally through the through the uh, the various structures like the technical board if it's a technical issue, the community council if it's a social issue with the code of conduct or something like that, or directly to Matt, to myself. If you see a bad interaction between a Debian developer and a Ubuntu developer, let us know. Because if it's something that we can work in our community, we can always do that. If you see a bad interaction coming from a Debian site, help that guy to do better. And, uh, and that's all, folks. Thank you.